good afternoon and welcome. Uh, for members who have not joined a previous IIEA webinar, we wish you and your best, uh, and yours the best in getting through this most difficult of times. It's our great pleasure today to welcome Tom Wright, a leading Irish export and expert in international affairs at the Brookings Institution in Washington, DC. He is director of the Center on the United States and Europe and a senior fellow in the, pro in the Project on International Order and Strategy at that institution. He's also a contributing writer for The Atlantic and uh, I very much I recommend his most recent essay in that publication. His most recent book, All Measures Short of War, The Contest for the 21st Century and the Future of American Power, was published by Yale University Press in May 2017. At this moment of unprecedented uncertainty, Tom will talk today about the United States, its politics and its place in the world. And he will take questions on these issues and many others, no doubt, uh, during the Q&A, which will be on the record. Before we get going, let, re let me remind you that we will be live tweeting this event at the handle at IIEA. So please feel free to join in. So with that, thank you, Tom, and over to you. Great, Dan, thank you so much. And thank you uh, to everyone at the Institute for having me back. I didn't anticipate the next time I'll be back, it will be from my house over a laptop virtually, um, but those are the times we're in. So it's a great uh, pleasure to be here, albeit under uh, difficult circumstances um, for everyone. So I thought what I would do is uh, talk for about 20 minutes or so, about half on what's going on in the United States on this, uh, particularly politically and economically, and then half on sort of the foreign policy, international order um, questions. Um, I'm sure everyone's fairly sort of familiar, you know, with the, the general trajectory um, of this over here, but I would just make a few sort of points starting out. I mean, I think what's really struck everyone is we spent the last three years saying, you know, President Trump, it, you know, has his faults and, and, and there's lots of problems in the administration, but there hasn't been a crisis yet. And as long as there's not a crisis, um, maybe we'll be able to model through in some way, right? That all of the daily da drama and sort of craziness that you see on your, on your TV screen or on your Twitter feed may not matter that much if the economy is going pretty well. And if there's sort of, you know, generally uh, the US is not involved in a major conflict or there's not a major crisis. Well, we now have the crisis and it's not just any old crisis. It's probably the most sort of complex difficult crisis that any government will be faced with. It's a health crisis first and foremost, um, but also economic, uh, international, all wrapped into one. And I think it's hard to imagine a crisis that will be less suited uh, to this administration, right? And it's not just um, the president. And it's also a very difficult crisis, I think, uh, for the country as well, for reasons I will um, get into um, in a second. But in terms of the administration, they had really not sort of anticipated, uh, I think, a global sort of pandemic, uh, even though um, there was intelligence warnings on it from probably around um, December of 2019. John Bolton had uh, dismantled the unit that was set up uh, after the, the Ebola uh, 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 virus in, in the, uh, five or six years ago. Uh, he dismantled that unit uh, in the White House and dispersed it to the agencies. And the reason really was that he did not believe that that sort of health policy had a core place in the national security infrastructure. He saw that as something more for development or for the CDC, and it just wasn't in that normal sort of framework. And, and that was uh, you know, separate to sort of the president's sort of activities. Now, there were some people in the White House, I think, who were um, sort of worried about this, more the folks who sort of look at it from the China um, side of it. Um, but Trump himself, I think, was worried more about the economic impact early on, and as we now sort of famously or infamously know, uh, downplayed it. Um, throughout, and I think the, he he did uh, undertake the uh, travel bans uh, on China, which is a partial ban near the end of uh, uh, January. Uh, Forty thousand people still came in after that, as the New York Times showed um, over the weekend. And there was later sort of a travel ban uh, to Europe, but that was really as the crisis was really uh, coming, uh, you know, was uh, resulting in restrictions and travel everywhere, and not many people were traveling at that point. But aside from those measures. Uh, he didn't use that time to build capacity uh, to really rally the states or rally the international community. And it wasn't only until late 
uh, sort of mid-March that we saw this sort of turnaround and now we have the daily press conferences where he's uh, sort of saying he's leaning into it, um, but he's still uh, perhaps more uh, restrained in the use of executive authority than any other president would be. A lot of attention here is focused on the Defense Production Act, which is this uh, piece of legislation that gives the president right, the right basically to command industry, uh, to undertake uh, certain production lines. If it's in the national interest, it's usually envisaged for a time of war or conflict, um, but it's applicable here. He only very recently uh, invoked that. And so that's sort of one of the leading examples um, of just how they've been sort of behind uh, on this. Um, but I think it's not just, it's fair to say it's not just uh, the president either. We have a federal system, obviously in the US, which gives a lot of power uh, to governors, which means it's very hard to actually have a unified uh, approach across the country. A, a president could uh, call for a nationwide stay-at-home order and um, that he, he has not done that, so it's up to the individual states. Um, the silver lining, I think, is that the federal system actually means that some governors can be more proactive than the president, right? So that probably wasn't really uh, imagined sort of three or four years ago if people were uh, wargaming a pandemic uh, scenario, they'd be assuming that the states were sort of laggards behind uh, the White House. But in this case, New York, um, California, Washington, uh, many others have been out ahead. Others have been significantly uh, behind, uh, Florida being the most uh, significant um, of those. So it's a bit of a patchwork effort. Um, we in Washington have sort of a stay-at-home order, but it's more lax, I think, than what you have uh, in Ireland. And there's uh, uh, fewer uh, restrictions. There's no sort of limitations, for instance, of on exercise or how far you go from your house or the number of times you go to the grocery store. Uh, so that sort of partial um, lockdown may uh, contribute, I think, across the country to these sort of extraordinary uh, sort of infection numbers and death numbers um, that we are uh, seeing now. The economic side is sort of interesting. I'll just spend a, a moment on that. Um, you know, it's, I'm sort of struck by the contrast of 2008, where there's basically universal support for massive stimulus packages. And the reason is, uh, is that nobody believes that the people who've lost their jobs here were to blame uh, for the crisis. Uh, you see some of the more uh, austerity focused people on Capitol Hill say, well, look, the banks in 2008 were responsible. We shouldn't have bailed them out. But the, uh, the restaurant sector, retail, uh, entertainment, and they had no uh, sort of control over this. And so a lot of the concerns about moral hazard or, um, or you know, or debt uh, and sort of long-term viability of the debt are, are not really uh, operable here. And so uh, senators like Tom Cotton, Marco Rubio, other sort of very conservative uh, types have been basically uh, Along, along similar lines to the Democrats and the numbers. Now, there are significant differences in some of the details, um, uh, particularly uh, with regard to the conditions that are attached to uh, some of the aid. Um, but for the most part, there's broad support for massive stimulus packages. And what we saw a couple of weeks ago um, will not be by any means sort of the last word in it. We're expecting you know, uh, uh, several sort of more, I think, over, over the duration um, of this. And um, the numbers, um, as in Europe, are very bleak. You know, we think we're at 13% unemployment now. That should go up to about 20% um, percent probably at peak. Um, Goldman Sachs, I think, estimate that even if there's a partial recovery, we'd be not at 9% um, by the election. Um, so this, I think, will be a very severe um, recession, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Just on the politics of this, President Trump got a bump, and that's pretty normal for a president at a time of crisis. Um, president George W. Bush's approval ratings after 9-11 were extremely high, I think over 75 or 80 percent. George H. W. Bush um, at, at the time of the invasion of Kuwait in 1990, over 90 percent. Presidents tend to do pretty well. Um, in a crisis, but those numbers can add away pretty fast. What was striking to me was that President Trump's bump was actually pretty small, right? So he has 60% approval and the handling of the crisis. That's not, now gone down to less than 50%, and his overall approval rating was at 49%, which was high for him, but still pretty low, and that's declined a bit. So I think he's actually going to face uh, quite a challenge if this crisis continues, as I think it will, um, through the election if unemployment remains um, high and if 
um, their sort of concerns about his missteps or how he's handling it. So I think he's in, uh, he's in sort of a difficult political spot, even if the temporary numbers um, are positive. Joe Biden has been fairly out of the picture. Again, that's not very surprising, right? Because uh, in the middle or at the beginning of the crisis, all of the attention is on the White House and the administration and that bully pulpit um, that the president has. Um, but I think over the summer, we will see sort of Biden come in uh, more in the media and uh, campaigning. Quite what that campaigning looks like, I think is a huge question. No one quite knows the answer to. There's conventions that are scheduled for the end of August, um, but it's widely believed they may be canceled. Obviously, mass rallies are probably very unlikely. Um, President Trump would be very uh, disappointed by that, of course. Um, but it imposes real limitations on Biden too. So I think it will be a very unusual election campaign. Um, a lot of the real concern is on the election itself. And some of you may have seen yesterday uh, where voters in Wisconsin went to the polls in the middle of a pandemic. It was highly controversial, an opinion from a, a court um, that mandated the election when a lot of people wanted to postpone it. Um, and so attention is naturally focused on uh, the November election. Can that be canceled? Can you have mail-in voting? What will we do if there's another outbreak then? And this is really sort of uncharted territory. You know, the constitution wasn't written uh, with a view to having an election um, during a pandemic. Democrats want to have mail-in uh, ballots, which are fairly common here, but not, uh, not universally applied across the states. Trump is opposed to that uh, largely because Republicans sort of believe that that sort of results in higher votes from Democratic um, voters. And he's sort of made that clear in press conferences. So we don't really know what an election would be like if people can't go to the polls. Um, one question people often have is, can Trump postpone the election? He can't. It has to be an act of Congress to postpone the election. So Nancy Pelosi would need to agree but even if they postpone the election, the inauguration date is set in the Constitution. So one way or the other, President Trump's uh, term expires in January uh, 2021, right? And if he does not, if there is no election or there is no successor, then he still leaves office, actually, and then it goes into the line of succession. Um, so Pence and him, their terms automatically end on January 20th. This is the 20th Amendment. Um, to the Constitution. So um, he, he does not have many sort of cards to play in terms of trying to, you know, stay in power, or use this uh, to, you know, to, to avoid the election altogether. But the worst case scenario is probably an election that partially goes off. You know, some states having it one way, other states saying they can't have an election, so they're just going to send electors to the electoral college, which they're entitled to do, uh, because the constitution says that only uh, state legislators have to do this, and then the state legislators choose to empower that to the people. Um, so this could easily end up in the courts, and it could be very messy, um, but it's not sort of a simple question of Trump just deciding to postpone it or cancel it and try to stay in power. So it will be, um, I think, a very difficult period, and Democrats are trying to use this next stimulus package to attach conditions that would ensure sort of a free and open sort of election by mail-in ballots or uh, other mechanisms. And that will be a big fight in the coming, um, in the coming weeks. Um, so just turning to the international picture, Dan kindly mentioned this piece um, I had in the Atlantic um, a few days ago. And really that piece was trying to ask what happens if this crisis goes on for 12 or 18 months, right? We, we believe from a lot of our leaders that our leaders seem to believe uh, that it could be over in the summer, that if we have this pain up front and that then it will be under control and then it will be sort of back to normal in some way. Um, I, I certainly agree that I don't think we'll see the level of shutdown that we have until there's a vaccine, but it seems pretty clear from the health experts and that we won't have a return of normal until there is a vaccine or until uh, there is uh, herd immunity uh, uh, achieved in, uh, across the world or in, uh, at least in some major countries and that that will take uh, 12 to 18 months. So for the next year, probably up until June, July of 2021, um, assuming that that's when a vaccine comes to the market, uh, there will be uh, significant changes uh, to our lives and to the economy. And I think that will have a major uh, sort of impact on uh, on the world sort of going forward. And the first uh, sort of piece of that I'd like to mention is on cooperation, because this is really the first crisis that the US has been completely absent as a global leader and has had really zero interest 
in coordinating cooperation between its allies or between other countries. Um, if you look at 2008 or 2009, um, the initial shock of that financial crisis was worse than the shock in 1929 to 33. So the first 12 months were a bigger drop, and, but then it eased off and it returned uh, to more positive uh, ground and much better than the 1929 to 33 crisis because uh, many experts believe, and I don't know if Dan agrees with this or not, but it, it, one hypothesis is that it was the international response, right? That the cooperation between countries, the enlightened steps that they took uh, meant that it was not as it was not a depression, right? But it wasn't the initial shock that was lesser than shocks of previous um, eras. Uh, well, in this case, the shock is incredibly bad, but the response is even worse, right? And so there's been virtually no cooperation at the G20 or G7 level, and it's not just Trump. I mean, I think he's the main culprit. He doesn't believe in it, but every other leader, with the possible exception of Emmanuel Macron. Um, basically are focused on their domestic crises because that's sort of the most challenging problem that they have in this sort of current moment. And we haven't really seen uh, countries sort of working together. We've seen these export controls over medical supplies, not just in the US, um, but in Europe um, as well and in other parts of the, of the world. And I, I think as we go forward, um, international cooperation will become more important, not less important. So there's a case to be made I sort of made this in the article that although it's a bad thing at the moment, you know, leaders should be focused on their domestic issues, right? They should also be looking at it internationally, um, but international is a smaller piece of this solution currently, um, but in the future will be quite a major piece. So think about how do you actually scale up in the vaccine and ensure that it gets to all of the places it needs to get to? How do we ensure that countries that are unable to cope with this crisis in the developing world or in particularly weak states with fragile health systems, that there can be support on a coordinated basis internationally to prevent any boomerang effect, whereby if we get rid of it in our own countries, then it comes back to us from those countries and just to help out those countries too, because they're in a difficult position. How do we ensure that as we rebuild our economies, we do so in a mutually beneficial way and not in a zero sum sort of beggar thy neighbor um, way. Uh, so how do, we, um, how do we look at learning lessons from this to create better international institutions and surveillance mechanisms that can prevent future pandemics because this almost surely will not be the last one in our lifetimes. Uh, so I think those are the type of things that require international cooperation. I think if Trump is reelected, it will make that cooperation extremely unlikely. And so we may go out of that sort of period in 2021 with a much more sort of nationalistic, inwardly focused uh, sort of approach to this, which I think will be uh, tragic and, and very sort of damaging in the long term. But I think that, and I don't know if the international order would really, uh, as we know it in terms of institutions and multilateralism, would survive that shock in 2021. I think it can survive what's going on this month and over the next um, few months. Um, another sort of concern that people have, which is sort of linked to the cooperation side, is US-China relations, right? China uh, obviously made a lot of missteps in this early on, uh, knew about it from sort of November of 2019, um, sort of suppressed information about it, um, suppressed the experts who were warning um, imposed sort of partial travel bans for travel in China, but not to the rest of the world, pressured the WHO. And um, so there's a lot of anger, I would say, here and, and elsewhere where in terms of China's response to that. But there's also widespread recognition that we need to cooperate with China, even if we disagree with how they handled it, and even if we're competing them with them in other areas. There was a letter a few days ago by 100 uh, sort of foreign policy uh, people, including Madeleine Albright, Steve Hadley, and others, calling for exactly this that I, I signed on to as well, but calling for cooperation with China. And what was interesting about that is you had a mixture of hawks who are quite uh, competitive toward China and people who also favor more sort of engagement, that they recognize that um, superpowers or great powers need to cooperate on global health. And there's a precedent for that in the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the United States cooperated in eliminating smallpox at the height of the Cold War and also cooperated in non-proliferation and other issues. And we've been unable to do that so far 
uh, with China. And I think that is something that will become particularly important in uh, 2021 um, as well. Um, uh, at the moment, I think there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, there, there, there's some sort of toying. We've seen some uh, opening between Trump and Xi after the phone call a couple of weeks ago. And we'll see where that goes. And one thing that I know is of interest to a lot of a lot of you as well is sort of globalization and supply chains and 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 sort of the lessons that will be drawn afterwards. I would say I think there are there is a widespread belief across the political spectrum here that it's sort of unacceptable that the U.S. would find itself without any capacity to manufacture and scale up quickly on crucial medical supplies for a pandemic that was widely sort of predicted. Right. And so the lack of ventilators, the fact that the U.S. is needing to find those in China or find face masks in China, concern about other critical pharmaceuticals. I mean, there will be an investigation probably along the lines of the 9-11 Commission. Once this is over or nearly over, they will draw sort of major policy conclusions and recommendations, and those are likely to be implemented. And I find it very hard to believe that a part of that will not be to ensure that the US does not get caught out again on that. And I'm sure other countries will have a similar approach. Um, the question is, what is the solution, right? Is the solution to be more sort of isolationist, self-sufficient, you know, pull back from global trade, uh, impose these very severe restrictions on companies, or is it to have more redundancy in the system? So even if it's a little bit economically inefficient, you're sort of buying insurance against this happening again, and you put in place regulations that require companies to sort of double up, um, or you have sort of trusted partners of like-minded countries that make ironclad commitments to share this at a time of crisis. So I think there's different sort of approaches coming out of it, but I think one thing we will not see is just a return to the status quo, because too many people have had their lives disrupted from this. I think the same is true, by the way, of the EU. I think it's highly likely that Macron and others say that the EU will need a greater sort of internal capacity. Uh, but the EU, I think, is even better off than the US in this. I mean, it's just been really dramatic. And part of, part of the problems here could be dealt with by the Defense Production Act. Um, but part of them are separate to that. There's just been a real sort of problem in getting companies that want to actually produce some of this equipment to be able to do it, given the manufacturing uh, plants that they actually have, which are sort of out of sync with what the um, requirements um, are. I just say a couple of other very brief um, things just on the World Health Organization that's gotten a lot of um, sort of attention over the last 24 hours because of Trump's announcement that he will consider stopping funding. Um, they're in a tough spot. You know, it's very difficult for an international institution um, to operate uh, in an environment where the major sort of powers have a lot of vested interests and are very sensitive to criticism. And I, I do sort of empathize in some way that they wouldn't want to sort of aggravate China early on, but at the same time, um, they gave advice um, that seemed to be at odds with what was happening at that particular moment in terms of human transmission, praising the Chinese response and advising against travel bans to buy time, which had a big impact in, in small countries in particular um, in Asia may have contributed to the problem in Europe. And I think there will be a real sort of reflection on this afterwards. And my main sort of takeaway is that sort of democratic, uh, liberal democratic countries need to work together more in these international institutions and engage more to ensure that China or other countries, you know, have a fair say and a legitimate say but don't sort of distort the objective analysis uh, of those institutions because we really need a World Health Organization that works effectively and efficiently. Um, and then I guess, Dan, I'm just out of time, I think, but the very final point is just in the Middle East, uh, which gets sort of neglected on this and maybe Africa as well. Um, I'm very worried by how this is affecting the Middle East. I think it really has ravaged Iran. I think Iraq, Lebanon, Egypt are particularly vulnerable. Uh, Egypt in particular is a country with I think very limited sort of capacity to deal with this in a health perspective. There's some signs that it's already gotten into the regime and, and uh, all throughout Egyptian um, society. And I think we may see the hollowing out of a lot of these already weak and fragile governments uh, in the Middle East. Um, and I worry too, it hasn't really, uh, really had a major impact in Africa yet, but I think we also can sort of see there 
um, that there's limited capacity as well. And social distancing, as many people have pointed out, is in some ways a privilege rather than you know something that everyone can do. And a lot of people don't have that option. And so if this disease takes the path that we've known it to take, I think the consequences could be devastating. And that just brings me back to the earlier point. It just underscores the importance of international cooperation and of leadership from Europe and the US and others on this to ensure that once we get past the immediate sort of domestic crises, that we also work together to provide unprecedented aid and assistance to these other countries that are unable to uh, do it for themselves. So Dan, with that, I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to our uh, conversation. Many thanks, Tom, and always a pleasure to get your big picture view on things. Um, People would like to ask questions, you'll see down at the bottom of your screen a Q&A function. Uh, if you could write your question in there with your name and your affiliation, that would be, uh, that would be great. Um, on the developing world, so that, let me just tell members that our Director of Research, Jill Donahue, is working very hard on our focus on the developing world. And one of the events we'll be running uh, over the coming weeks will be looking at the effects of the, uh, the, pandemic, the pandemic on the developing world. Tom, if I could kick off with a sort of shared question with Porrick Murphy, who's the chair of our geopolitics group. You mentioned the absence, this is the first major global crisis without uh, American leadership. Just wondering if there's any behind the, uh, behind the scenes uh, things going on, the State Department, for example, which you'd be familiar with. I'd be a little bit more positive in terms of central banking cooperation. The Federal Reserve is in close, working closely with the other big central banks. And, and frankly, in the economic response at this point, the only institutions that really, really matter in just addressing the, the immediate shock are central banks, for central banks to open the taps and be lenders of last resort, both in, within their own countries and amongst each other, so that the, uh, the currencies can be, uh, uh, you don't get a blockage in the currency uh, system. So the Federal Reserve has been doing uh, that. Port Murphy specifically wonders um, if the US could exploit its reserve uh, currency status in some way uh, during this crisis. Now, I know economics is, is not your uh, uh, full specialization, but if you have any thoughts on that uh, and uh, the prospects of sub, uh, um, let's say, White House cooperation with other, with other uh, countries at the State Department level, et cetera. Yeah, no, great question. So, um, so the good news first, I think you're right, when we do see at the agency level, sort of that network cooperation between the US and other countries, right? So the Fed, um, I think is playing a very constructive role as it did in 2008 or nine. Uh, Federal Reserve is of course independent uh, from, um, the, from the White House and, and the chair of the Federal Reserve has clashed a lot, or Trump has clashed a lot with the chair of the Federal Reserve over the last couple of years. Um, so that has continued. The CDC, I think, as well, and other sort of agencies in the U.S. government um, have uh, maybe slightly reduced them before, but still have a significant footprint around the world. And I think they are working, I'm told, pretty sort of efficiently and effectively uh, with their partners and with other countries, the exception being China, where the CDC's sort of footprint had, had basically been ended uh, by the Trump administration under fairly sort of controversial circumstances over the last couple of years that so they've had less engagement there. But I think generally speaking, we've seen uh, the CDC and other sort of major agencies remain engaged. And um, the higher up you go, the worse it gets though, right? So Pompeo has really been completely absent as far as we can tell. There's been quite a few sort of articles on him in the last week, uh, in particular, sort of calling to attention to this, that he's not actually on the phones trying to rally uh, the world or think about what comes next or, or looking for ways uh, that the US can lead on this or trying to bring together the G20 or G7. There was a G7 call, but actually it was suggested by Macron. Macron did all the work and he let Trump share it and then he did all the follow-up, right? So, uh, and Trump let it be known that he wasn't really that into it. Um, that he would have sort of preferred not to do it. So it was a positive call, I think, and it worked out reasonably well, but it was just a sign of how the US wasn't um, all that engaged. In terms of the question on the reserve currency, I think that's a very sort of interesting one. I think it's unlikely because um, I think when you look at the key players, whether it's you know the Fed or whether it's the Treasury Department, like Steve mentioned, for all of his faults is actually pretty 
um, multilaterally minded in terms of international economic cooperation coordination, maybe not at the institutional level, sort of IMF, World Bank, but it tends to be more mainstream in these debates from what we know compared to somebody like Peter Navarro, right? And Mnuchin, I think, still is a significant um, figure in all of this. And he's been pretty constructive, actually, on the on the domestic side of the stimulus negotiations. Trump is not speaking terms of Pelosi, um, but Mnuchin has done a lot of the heavy lifting there. I've been fairly critical of him before, so I've been sort of pleasantly surprised by the, some of the things he's done here. And then the other sort of, just if you're looking at the internal sort of dynamics of it, the other little nuance is just within the National Security Council, um, there are people in there, I think, who are fairly sort of engaged and inclined to cooperate, particularly with allies, maybe not so much with China. The Deputy National Security Advisor and some others um, have, been, have been fairly sort of consistent on that. But the problem is, of course, the president, because he's so engaged every day in the press conferences that there's frequently a big gap between he, what he comes out and says and what his team is saying or, or positioning for. Forgive me there, we uh, making mistakes with technology. Um, two questions from two of our members, one from Noel Fahi, who was ambassador to the US, Ireland's ambassador to the US. Um, he's wondering about India, whether you've thoughts on India, whether you've been in contact with colleagues uh, in India on what's happening there. Noel Hallahan uh, has a question, another uh, um, Institute member has a question on domestic politics. If there's a high level of uh, deaths in the US, in, in particular, what impact that could have on uh, swing states? Yeah, um, so on India, uh, I'm very worried about India, I think because, because of the social distancing problem, right? It's, it's almost impossible to imagine, uh, you know, Modi being able to implement sort of an effective social distancing model um, in India. Um, I think it's, you know, the, 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 there's been some speculation that maybe COVID-19 might abate as it gets warmer. It's definitely getting warmer in India at the moment, but there's very little sign that that, that, that will happen, right? And so I don't think they'll necessarily be saved um, by the summer in this. There is uh, quite a lot of, you know, evidence so far that it can, you know, it, it may be maybe less severe in the summer, but it still persists. And so I think India could be in for a real uh, sort of challenge and problem. And I think that sort of gets to the to the point about international cooperation. You know, the, I think India should be, along with some other countries, should be um, sort of Pompeo's sort of top priority list and trying to ensure that everything can be done uh, to help because ultimately um, we're all, all only really as strong as our weakest link on this, which is not to say that that's India, but I think it is by far sort of the largest, most significant country that seems to have a real uh, sort of problem in terms of its capacity to deal with it, just because of the, um, be, be, you know, because of the structure of the of, of the country. Um, in terms of the election here, um, yeah, and I just read the the question there in the Q and A, and it was sort of if there are lower debts than the two hundred forty thousand than President Trump has said, would it help him in the swing states? Um, you know, I think he will say that. Um, he will say if it's anything less than that, that he succeeded. I don't really think people will buy it, but I think one thing you have to look at though is um, that's sort of interesting is the granular detail in the state. So let's take a state like Florida. Um, Florida is run by the governor DeSantis there. He um, implemented changes to the unemployment scheme several years ago, whereby he basically made it impossible for you to apply for unemployment benefits. Right? And he did it because he wanted to keep the numbers low. So for instance, uh, to get unemployment benefit in Florida, you need to prove that you've talked to five potential employers in the last week, right? So one a day about a job to be able to get that unemployment benefit. You have to apply online, not in person. And the website is sort of underfunded and frequently crashes, right? They set this up because unemployment was very low and they didn't want anyone to be tempted to go on to it. But what that means now uh, is that basically you have an unemployment system that's completely inadequate for the scale of this crisis that has hit. And you've hundreds of thousands of Floridians, uh, many of whom probably voted for President Trump, right? Who can't get the, the assistance that they're entitled to under the national stimulus plan and the extension of unemployment protection. Because as you know, here obviously the safety net is much worse um, than it is in Europe. 
that is already shaping up to be a huge political problem for Republicans in Florida. And I, I just think that if this continues, and again, I think it will, and that these economic problems will be very sort of significant and persistent, and there will be a real sort of reaction against sort of the, 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 the holes in the safety net and the, the problems that the federal government has in helping people, because this is not a normal sort of unemployment crisis, right? This is a cliff um, that was imposed by the federal government for health reasons. Some of the other states, you know, Governor Whitmer in, in, in Michigan is sort of emerging as a contender for the vice presidential nomination uh, for Joe Biden. She's been fairly um, impressive um, so far, so that could have a bit of an impact um, there. So I guess my answer is, is that I think, you know, Trump will definitely engage in this overall effort to say he's, you know, had the greatest response ever. I think Democrats will sort of point out that he made all of these massive mistakes and it didn't need to be this way. And that if you compare it to Ebola or H1N1, that the consequence and cost being amongst the worst of any major advanced sort of industrialized uh, country is really outrageous. And that debate will take place. But there is also these uh, state level dynamics, I think, uh, that will work against him. And I think Biden is actually pretty well positioned to take advantage of that. Biden's very popular in Florida, for instance, you know, and he's quite strong, obviously, in the Midwest as well. Good, thanks, uh, Tom. So a question from Magella O'D asking, uh, what prospects are there of a federally uh, mandated shutdown that, that, the, that the, the president would override all of the states and, and demand a uh, shutdown? Bill M is also a member, former uh, uh, editor and chief of the Economist, asks uh, bipartisanship on China. Uh, do you think that will be strong after this and, and strongly um, uh, hostile, but at least strongly strong vis-a-vis -vis China? And he asks a second question. People have often speculated as to what might induce senior Republicans to break with Trump. Do you see any signs that this could finally happen? over the pandemic? Um, yeah, so um, in answer to the first one, I think there's virtually no chance of a national stay-at-home order, even though he should do that, um, because he hasn't done it yet, um, because I think his instincts are still to reopen the economy. Uh, he wants to deflect responsibility to the governors, so he wants to be able to say, well, I didn't close your economy, the so governors did. And I think if there is appetite from certain states to reopen the economy, that will push on an open door with Trump, right? So I think that that is something he should definitely do. And it's something Fauci, I think, wants him to do. I just think there's very little likelihood that he will actually um, do it. In terms of major Republicans breaking, uh, I, don't, I don't expect that to happen either. I mean, they, you know, if you look just as an example the other day, with this uh, uh, naval issue, with the sec Secretary of the Navy modely criticizing this commander of an of a aircraft carrier who sent a letter because the disease was infecting his, uh, uh, his crew, and then he was fired by Modley, and there was virtually nothing about him at all uh, from others, from senior Republicans. And then Modley, after uh, Trump criticized him at a press conference or implicitly criticized him, and then the Secretary of Defense asked him to resign. Then all of a sudden, all these Republicans on Capitol Hill started to criticize Motley, the Secretary of the Navy, for how he handled Crozier, right? And what that tells me um, is that they have no desire to say anything critical of the administration until they have a permission slip to do so, right? And so if Trump says it's okay, they'll do it. Otherwise, I think they're just hunkering down. So I don't see any major change in that um, pattern um, there. On China, uh, look, yeah, I think there is a bipartisan uh, approach. I mean, th there's very little trust uh, in the Chinese leadership on this issue. There's a lot of frustration with how they handled it, uh, acknowledging that the U.S. made mistakes too um, domestically, but I think there's a lot of frustration and anger even with how China handled it. Um, but for the most part, I think people recognize that you need some cooperation with China and there's a real frustration with the administration until recently to be spending most of their time trying to think about what to call COVID-19 and to try to, you know, call it the Chinese virus, which had all these ethnic and sort of racist issues with it. 
um, and, and really was uh, at best a massive sort of distraction um, from the need to actually have some coordination with Beijing, right? So I think that for the most part, I'd say the foreign policy people in both parties uh, see it that way. And there are some sort of dissenters. So Tom Cotton, you know, from, uh, from, from Arkansas, I think has been someone who's calling for punishing China after this. Um, I, I'm not sure that will go anywhere, but I think there will be a generally a, a shift toward a more skeptical competitive approach and that no one's really going to say, look, you know, Xi Jinping is operating in good faith and he should be our main partner in this and we can work together. What they will say is we can't really trust him. You know, we can't trust what's coming out. So we need to try to verify it by ourselves, but we still need mutual interest-based cooperation and to bring China in to that sort of solution because you can't have an approach to pandemics or, or climate change that doesn't include China. Um, thanks, Tom. So three sort of linked up questions. Ellen Hazelcorn asks, do you think the Democrats will now rally around Biden? Uh, Peter Gunning asks, is there reason for, or more puts it, that surely there's reason for optimism if there's a change of president in November or January um, in, in terms of international cooperation, multilateralism? And the third one from Fergal Nyson from the Department of Foreign Affairs, let me just read it. Under the 20th Amendment, who chooses the new president if there is no election? The Senate, the House, or combined choice of both houses? That last one's a particularly tough one. <laughs> um, I don't know the answer to the last one. Actually, I've been trying to find it out. I think it's, there's no real planning for no election. And also it's up to each individual state how they conduct a federal election. So you could imagine a situation where, you know, some states don't have a popular election, but vote even remotely in their legislators to send electors, you know, um, and then you have other states that have popular votes. Um, and there's a question mark about the legitimacy of the election overall. I think it's, it's, it's not, again, it's not really within the power of you know, the administration to, um, you know, to just not have the election or to unilaterally postpone it or cancel it. Um, but let's say that there isn't actually sort of a legitimate election because the pandemic is maybe as bad then as it is now. Um, then I think it's just really actually a simple matter of the line of succession, right? So, you know, Trump and Pence um, are no longer president on January 20th. The House and the Senate will not have sent in sort of the, the, the president-elect, right? There's a process for that where the electoral college meets and then it's ratified for Cong by Congress. So that will not happen. So then in default, it will go to the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. Uh, if, if for some reason she's not, you know, elected, then it will go to the next person, the president pro tem and, and down. Um, but it would, it would, you know, probably go no more than fourth in terms of the president pro tem who will be, uh, there, which is sort of ironically the oldest person in the Senate in the majority party. So I think it's pretty, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a drama set for sort of a West Wing episode or, or House of Cards. I think in some way we don't really know that much about it, but I suspect there'll be a lot more attention. But I do think the election will happen, um, but I think it could end up in the courts in terms of the mechanism of it. On Biden, yeah, I think, you know, you do see that already. I mean, Democrats are rallying around Biden. The only thing that hasn't happened yet is Sanders hasn't dropped out. But for all intents and purposes, he is the uh, designate nominee. Um, there's a big question mark around the convention. I think it's unlikely probably the convention happens. They've already postponed it by a month. Um, but it can take place virtually. Um, once that happens, he's officially the nominee. But I think, you know, he is widely seen now as the actual sort of, uh, you know, nominee elect, as it were. And then the other, Dan, what was the middle question? So, uh, Peter Gunning uh, um, asked about or posed the, the idea that a change of president yeah. will surely lead to more and better international cooperation. Support, Abs multilateral absolutely. Things. I mean, absolutely. And I, I think it's, you know, all of Biden's instincts on this are to do it internationally and cooperatively. Um, and uh, I actually, I have a, hopefully have a piece coming out on this exact topic actually in the next few days which I'll, I'll share with you once it, once it publishes. But um, I think the other reason to be optimistic about uh, Biden, if he were to win, 
it's as I mentioned earlier, the need and demand for international cooperation will be more, will be greater in 21 than it is today, right? So most of the heavy lifting on the multilateral front shouldn't take place at the moment, right? It, it will take place in six or eight months in terms of, you know, planning for after the crisis, putting in place new institutions, you know, ensuring that the economic rebuild is coordinated, helping out developing countries that are still um, struggling. Um, so all of these, all of these questions, I think, will be for the next president. So we're sort of a little bit lucky in that regard. But of course, the flip side of it is, if Trump is re-elected, then I think we will see a real hemorrhaging of the international order. And I would just sort of point out that it's interesting. My my understanding of it is that other leaders like Macron and Merkel. You know, initially they were petrified of Trump, then they thought they could deal with him and muddle through. Now they're back to being petrified, right? Because they realize what it's like to have a leader of a major ally that has zero interest in working with them and is actually pretty difficult and, and doing things that are counterproductive. And, and I think that will actually be worse even next year than it is this year. Okay. Uh, Mari Cross, a board member at the Institute, asks, do you think that Iran will be weakened by this epidemic to an extent that politics in the Middle East has changed? And David Kelly of Korea asks, well, let go with that one and I'll, I'll, um, I'll get Yeah, that one. look, I think this has really affected Iran very badly um, and very early. You know, I mean, it, it seems like the city of come you know, with this religious festival that the COVID-19 got out and affected a significant number of people in the regime. There was those extraordinary videos early on of you know the health minister saying there's no problem while he was coughing and sick and then the next day he was diagnosed with COVID-19 and senior members of the establishment have died from it already and maybe a lot more than we um, know of. Um, so I think it is you know they, it is a very uh, they're very fragile um, I think what's been happening here in terms of reinforcing sanctions is unfortunate because even if you're uh, very critical of the regime, I think it's important that the Iranian people can deal with this sort of effectively and again, where you're only as strong as our weakest link ultimately on this. So all countries uh, should be helped to deal with this uh, pandemic. And I think we do need to take a tough look at that and, and a tough look at sanctions and suspend them temporarily, perhaps, and try to get more international assistance into Iran to help them deal with this. But I think uh, not because of the regime, um, but because uh, it's affecting sort of the Iranian people, whether it leads to a change. Um, I've been asking a lot of my colleagues this to work in the Middle East, and, and what they basically say is that um, it won't, because, at least not in the short term, because there's no organized opposition in these countries, uh, include Egypt in that. What you'll see is just a collapse in capacity to, and a collapse in governance, and maybe the emergence of zombie governments that aren't really able to deal with the problems that are affecting their societies. But it will be so severe um, that it, there really won't be space for normal sort of politics, right? There's no mechanism by which there were, now, if, if a leader were to, you know, if the Ayatollah were to get this or, you know, Sisi, you know, were to, to you know, were to, uh, to get it, you know, obviously there would be a change, but no one knows what that change would be. It would more likely be somebody from within the regime than sort of a change of regime. I think overall, um, does it affect the power balance in the Middle East? I think it weakens you know, all of the Arab uh, states and, and Iran, you know, it weakens all of them. I think Israel is a separate, you know, case here. It's a very separate society and deals with this more akin maybe to a European country or to the US or Canada. Um, but I think it's, it's very bad news for the Middle East overall. Um, David Kelly's question, what lasting impact the COVID, uh, could the COVID-19 crisis have on state versus federal authority? How united will the United States be after the crisis? And um, the Director General uh, here at the Institute, uh, Michael Collins, uh, asks you, how would you evaluate how the media in the US has dealt with the, uh, with the pandemic and the crisis? Yeah, um, so I think that it depends partly on the election, right? I think if, if Trump is defeated, I think you'll probably see a pretty unified approach because 
everyone recognize a huge mistakes are made. You know, there needs to be a real accounting for what happened. Um, you know, there will be a, a, a look at a stronger federal authority the next time and more redundancy within the system and a set of protocols to follow. Um, if Trump is reelected, on the other hand, I can imagine him being very defensive about it and saying he didn't do anything wrong, so everything's absolutely perfect. So no need to do anything different. And he'd probably oppose a commission to look into it. Um, but I think assuming that it's Biden, just for the sake of, of the question, um, I think we will see major changes. I think each individual state will have to improve um, their protocols and response to it. But I think also we'll see a call for a much stronger federal response uh, the next time. So as federal stay at home um, order, you know, federal supplies of PPE and other uh, critical medical supplies, rather than saying to the states, like, you guys go do it. And if you get stuck, let us know and we'll see what we can do. So I think there'll be a lot sort of there. On, on um, Michael's question on the media, I think the media has actually handled it reasonably well. I mean, there's been some extraordinary reporting on it, um, particularly from the Times and the Post and some others, just revealing details about the original outbreak and then some of the, uh, some of the failures here in the US in the response and some of the stories in Europe. I think some of that reporting has really been extraordinary and they were on it early you know, from sort of mid late January on. And so I think they really sort of did pretty well. In terms of the broadcast media, um, you know, obviously Fox, I think, has really failed on this because it was part of this echo chamber saying it wasn't really anything different than the flu. Um, but I think for the most part, cable has been reasonably, you know, cable is never sort of great and, 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 and you know, Socratic and Jeffersonian about this. But I think, I, I don't think it sort of made you know, the problem much worse than it, than it needed to be. So I think the media did, did, did okay, but I think the print media in particular um, have just been sort of extraordinary on it. Okay, good. Uh, Nora Owen, amongst other things, a former minister, asks, do you have any insights into um, reports around Biden's health? Uh, I haven't heard that, but I'm sure you're closer to these things. Uh, I think uh, he's, yeah, I think there's, you, you know, I think he's doing well. I mean, I, I haven't, I'm not totally sure about the r rumors that she, she uh, reports she's referring to, but overall, I mean, before this, there was questions about his age um, and, you know, and just, his, you know, the, the his interview style and whether or not it was to do with this old stutter or was something else. And I think that's sort of an ongoing, uh, you know, just political conversation here. And, but based on everything we know, and based on his medical sort of records, he's in he's in good health. I mean, he is uh, sort of sequestered at home at the moment, like everyone else. And um, there's been a few challenges early on because his home actually isn't set up uh, for broadcast or anything like that. So he did a couple of uh, 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 media spe uh, speeches and, and and other set piece events, and they're a bit like us here, you know, just sort of speaking from your desk. Uh, over Zoom, and so they've been working on that, I think, just from an image point of view. Um, but I, I think we will see more of him, I think, in the next month or two. It's very hard to compete in the early stages of a crisis with a president who has an uh, hour and a half long press conference every day. You know, so I think his health is good. But look, I think for either Trump or Biden, COVID-19 is a big personal risk. You know, they'll be out there, they'll be campaigning. If it was your, you know, if it was a relative, you'd be saying, you know, do not go out of the house for the next sort of eight or nine months. And, you know, don't be going out next October, November, when it could be quite bad. You know, try to remove yourself from people. Biden is 78, 79, you know, Trump is 74. So they are at risk. Um, there's no doubt about that. But, but I don't really have any reason to think, you know, that they're sort of, it's affected either of them sort of yet. Okay. Connor Fagan uh, from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade wonders, um, what impact all, all this will have on cooperation specifically on climate change, make it more difficult or more likely? Yeah, I think you can sort of tell either story here. You know, the positive story is it reminds us of these long-term risks and actually being prepared and working together. I certainly hope that's true. Um, the other side of it is, is that the governments just are going to be completely preoccupied with COVID-19 and the aftermath for the next few years, because even if there's a vaccine and this is over, um, we're still dealing with the repercussions of it, right? In terms of economics, politics, 
institutionally preventing it from happening again. So if you look in, in Europe, for instance, at van der Leyen, you know, I think she thought her commission presidency would be about climate change and the Green New Deal. Now I'm pretty sure she thinks it's and knows it's about COVID-19, right? And so I think you just see a shift in the emphasis and in the time that leaders are dedicating to this. So I don't think anyone's going to say climate change doesn't matter or we shouldn't really work on it. I think they'll continue to say those things. But the type of actions that we needed, I think we'll see some of them, but not maybe as many as we would have seen, you know, had this not occurred. Um, so, but I, I could sort of, you know, I think you, you can make either deductive case at the moment. We don't really know where it's going to come down on. Okay, last one or two, Tom Ferris, a life member here at the Institute, asks about the impact of the virus on the southern U.S. states, and I suppose more generally, yeah. uh, you know, is there going to be a regional pattern? Will the poorer U.S. states uh, be hit uh, further, or will federal funds uh, ramp up to, to affect the most, uh, the, the most badly affected areas? Yeah, look, there's no reason to think this is not going to affect all of the country. Right, and the White House has said they are worried about hot spots in red states, you know, as they're called politically. Um, Louisiana, I think, is a particular concern. You know, Florida is a coastal state, but maybe a separate. But, you know, in rural areas, I think because there's not as much density of population, it's probably slower to spread, um, but only slower, not that it won't spread. And so I think it will affect the whole country and I think they are worried about that. I think for the last few weeks it's been easy in a way for Fox and some others to tell a story that this is more a city-based thing and you don't really need to worry about it in the rest of the country but I think Fauci and uh, and others in, in the administration sort of understand that that's not the case. So I think that we will see that I think in the next um, month or so and I do think Trump will for obvious political reasons you know be more responsive to some of those states, you know, than he has been to New York um, or to Michigan or to Washington State. So uh, I think that's sort of just an unfortunate reality about how the, this White House operates. The very last one, Tom, um, from Tom Hennessy, again, the Department of Foreign Affairs. Uh, just picking up, well, I, I'm picking up on one of the quotes from your, your, your piece. Um, you spoke to uh, an EU official about how things would work out in Europe. And he told you uh, that, quote, it would bring out the best and the worst in us, maybe both simultaneously. Uh, Tom Hennessy's question is, is about EU-US cooperation. Uh, where do you see that going? EU-US EU, cooperation? Yeah. Yes. Um, well, yeah, on the quote, I think it was, it was interesting that they, um, yeah, I think they're worried about, you know, the politics of this as it goes forward in Europe. Right, that on euro bonds, corona bonds, sort of a common response. That right now, the the feeling, you know, there's a lot of sympathy, but over time, um, it may be more difficult, especially in Germany. And we've already seen that last night, you know, with this rather difficult euro group um, meeting. And so, you know, ultimately, people tend to sort of hunker down into their national perspectives. And I think that's what that person was 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 saying. In terms of US, EU, um, I, again, I think it comes back to the election. You know, Trump has had this real bee in his bonnet about the EU. You know, Biden, I think, is a very strong supporter of the EU, and you'll see a massive uptick in engagement with the EU if he wins in November. Um, but I think that the real sort of question is, uh, what is the substance of that? And I think that brings us back to what we were talking about earlier, in terms of the vaccine, in terms of, of a coordinated preparation for the next time, a real lessons learned, uh, you know, mechanism to try to figure out the failings everywhere over the last few months and presumably the next six to eight months. Um, so I think there's huge scope because, you know, in the U.S., as I think a lot of people on the call know, um, when people think of Europe, they tend to think of NATO, and it's like, how do we work with NATO on this? But NATO has very little role on this. I mean, maybe a tiny bit, but you know, there's no real capacity for health and pandemics in NATO. It's a little bit, but it's much more in the EU and at the national level. And so engaging on that now in the EU too, as you know, you know, health is not a really a core competency of the EU, right? So the EU is not super strong in that either. But I think maybe to turn around one of the questions that someone else had earlier. There might need to be a reassessment of that after the fact in the same way that there would be in a state 
federal basis over here. But I think the U.S. needs to engage with Europe at multiple levels on this uh, next year. Good. Tom, as ever, it's uh, fantastic to get reviews. Look forward to uh, catching up in person uh, when this is all over or at least some sort of yeah. so, uh, normality has been returned. So many thanks for, for joining and us. And thank you all end. of you. Thank you to everyone as well. And, and please all uh, stay safe. And I, I look forward to being over with you in person at some point in the not too distant future. Many thanks. Good. And everyone, uh, all the members, thank you for joining. Thanks for your many questions. Just to flag our next event next week, we'll be with former Italian Prime Minister Enrico Letta. Uh, many interesting things to say about his country and the future of Europe. We look forward to welcoming you to that event. And in the meantime, very best to you and yours.